Alright, on the left hand side we've got this blue curving glass curtain wall building. The kids on Reddit call it the Wiggly Building. Its real name is the St. Regis of Chicago. It was completed in 2020. The architect is Studio Gang. The lead architect is Genie Gang. And that is the tallest building in the world with a female architect as a lead architect. It is also overall the third tallest building in the city of Chicago. Now, it is apartment, condo, hotel, office, and retail space. If you look up towards the top, it looks like it's not quite finished yet. It didn't pass the wind sharing test. So that's called the blow-through floor. So it has, allows the wind to blow through like a vent, and it keeps the top from breaking up. So that's a thing. So this is the part of the floor where I usually share the trivia of the day. But the trivia of the day today was really boring and it kind of confused me. So instead, I am going to talk to you about what has become a Chicago tradition. How many of you have heard of or tried Malort? You need to go to a bar and I'm going to try it. It's a, it's a Chicago institution. It didn't used to be that, so I did a little bit of research. And it was not. It's a Scandinavian based alcohol, and it was a family business and the guy who owned the work was in the work. And he died and he lost his liquor company to his legal secretary. Now she didn't like it very much and she always bemoaned me doing a little live. 
why can't you make something I would want to drink? And they never plan for it to be profitable, but some guy, a hipster, got really interested in her at 20... Owls. And it's inspired by European cathedrals. If you look up there, flying buttresses. In European cathedrals, flying buttresses are loaded there. The Tribune Tower, they are merely ornamental. Now the Tribune moved out, the building's going to condo. I was thinking about it for a little bit, but then my commute would be too short. And I use my commute to improve on my tour. Oh, and they range from about 700 to 800. All right, back on to the right-hand side of the boat. We've got this red brick building called the Hyatt Regency. South of that is a white building with black vertical windows, the Aeon Center. It's also been called the Standard Oil Building and the Amico Buildings. And it's the fourth tallest building in the city of Chicago. It's originally clad in Italian Clara marble, which is some of the most expensive marble in the world. It's what Michelangelo used. They cut down on building costs, they came it too thin, and it didn't hold up well during Chicago winters. So they had to take all the marble off and reclad it for a fill on ground. Costs about eighty million dollars, which just goes to show you can't take marble for granted. I don't tell that one very often, but I'm feeling bolder. It takes some stones. I have a whole slate of jokes. All right, now we've got this blue green glass building with the white undulating balconies. Undulating is a five dollar word for curvy. This is Aqua. It's an award winning residential building in two thousand and nine. The architect is Studio Gang, the lead architect is GD Gang. And until 2020, that was the tallest building in the world with a female architect as a lead architect. Now you might be wondering what replaced it, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But right now I gotta tell you that this body of water we're on is called the Chicago River. At its deepest point, it's 22 feet deep, and it used to flow into Lake Michigan, which was and is our source of drinking water. In the 1800s, we created this rock, river like a coil. We use it to discard all of our industrial, animal, and human goods. I should also add, we had one of the best plumbing systems in the United States of America at the time. So you can Google pictures of chickens walking across the Chicago River. In 1885, we had a torrential rainstorm, with very strong winds coming out of the bus. And the concern was that the wind was going to push the river water two miles off the shores of Lake Michigan into our drinking water and food. And then we would have a problem. Luckily, that didn't happen, but we knew we had to do something. So we formed the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. If you're not from Chicago, you might be going to hear a really inspiring story on how we were pioneers in heating of our water. No, I'm going to tell you how we made our problem someone else to have. Between the South Branch of the Chicago River and the Springs River, there's a portage. We get a canal 35 feet deep whose gravity says water goes to the deepest part. We named it with sanitation and ship for the two canals. And on January 2nd, 1900, we opened the canal and we reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So now it flows down the South Branch, down the canal, down the Desplaines River, down the Illinois River, down the Mississippi River, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. We could take this boat to New Orleans, but I've got plans after work, so no. Uh, I digress, we got sued, first by St. Louis, because their source of drinking water was and is the Mississippi River, and they were concerned that we were going to contaminate their drinking water. Unfortunately for them, the trial was held in Chicago, and they lost. Don't worry, they got even with us. They bottled up that gross, disgusting river water and sold it back to us in the form of Budweiser. <laughs> we then got sued by Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin. They were concerned that we were going to drain Lake Michigan. We lost that lawsuit through the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District built the Chicago Harbor Law. So it was built for one reason and one reason only, and that's to regulate the amount of water that can be into the Chicago River from Lake Michigan. Because of the lock, Lake Michigan is now a few feet higher than the Chicago River. So every time the lock opens, about 800,000 gallons of Lake Michigan water comes into the Chicago River. 
This is how it works. It's a, the Riverside Gate would open, the boat would go in, the Riverside Gate would close. The Lake Michigan Side Gate would open just a little bit and start filling the lock chamber with water. So one way to think of lock chamber is thinking of a giant bathtub, and the boat is the world's largest rubber ducky. So it's the lock chamber filled with water, it's going to lift the boat up. Once the boat is level with Lake Michigan, the gates open wide, and the boat would go out of Lake Michigan. Now we've got on the left hand side this building with a curvy black glass curtain wall. Lake Point Tower condominiums. We in 1968. The architects are Shipwright and Heinrich. Now, there's a rumor that Oprah Winfrey used to live in this building. Oprah never, ever lived there. She might have started the rumor herself because she lived at Water Tower Place, but she just didn't want people to know where she lived. Well, look at what you see. You can see pictures of the West Coast wildfires. Luckily, it rain started to rain about two days later, and that extinguished the fire. Well, we had a healthy paranoia burning to the ground, and to this day, Chicago has some of the strictest fire codes in the United States of America. And within a month of the Great Chicago Fire, the co-owner and publisher of the Chicago Tribune ran for mayor and won on the platform of the Fireproof Party. Tickles me to know that was a thing. So we wanted to become a world-class city, and we found out the World Columbia Exposition was coming to the United States of America. And what a better way to put ourselves on the map than by hosting a World Fair. So we sent our very best politicians to Washington, D.C., and they lobbied their little hearts out. And we ended up getting awarded the fair, which is great for us, but it made New York a little bitter. And one of their journalists referred to our politicians as windy, windy bad from the windy city for a full of hot air. And that is why we are called the Windy City. Not because we're the windiest city in America, which we are not, but because our politicians are full of hot air. I find this to be very unfair if you know anything about Chicago politics or Illinois politics as a whole. We are known for having from the most honest, above board politicians you could ever hope to vote for. Well, they're under indictment. Now, the fair itself ended up becoming one of the most important events in Chicago history, starting with Daniel Burnham, who planned what's famously known as the White City. It was on the south side of Jackson Park. It was comprised of 250 temporary buildings made out of material a little bit like drywall. He got so interested in city planning that he went on to be a city planner, and he planned many notable cities. Most importantly, his hometown of Chicago. And we are considered to be one of the best planned cities in the world. If you're enjoying our expansive boulevards, you can thank Daniel Burnham. The landscape architect is a guy named Frederick Law Olmsted. He is a bit of a rock star in architect circles. He designed Central Park, Prospect Park, the entire park system of Louisville, Kentucky, and the list goes on and on. So Ferris highlighted the greatest innovation of the day. What were the greatest innovations of 1893? Well, the previous World Fair was held in Paris. Does anybody know the centerpiece of the Paris Fair? Eiffel Tower. Burnham and the gang, they wanted to out Eiffel Eiffel. So they found their very own structural engineering marvel called the Ferris Wheel. That's right. Very first Ferris Wheel in the world was right here in Chicago. It was over 200 feet tall, made partially out of wood. It had approximately 60 dime below, which held roughly 100 people each, and it took 40 minutes to get around. Other innovations were juicy tooth gum, cracker jack, the zipper, a little thing called electricity. I think that stayed clean. And Paps Blue Ribbon Beer. Originally just called Paps Beer. They entered into a contest at the fair and it received a ribbon. So they renamed themselves so we would all know they were an award winning beer. If you've ever had PBI, you might be wondering. How bad is all the other beer? This is the beer that won. It was a participation ribbon. All of the beers got a ribbon. So the fair lasted for six months. 27 million people came. And it turned a profit. So they decided to do it all over again in 1933 with a fair called the Century of Progress. And that was all the we called Museum Campus. 
That's where you can find the Shedd Aquarium, the Adler Planetarium, the Field Museum, and Soldier Field, which is where the bears play. So, where Missouri lives. That's all part of Grant Park, also part of Grant Park, but not part of Museum Campus. It's the artist from Chicago. It's one of the top 10 art museums in the world. Largest collection of precious art outside of Paris. I highly recommend it. All right, see on the right hand side, see this green Art Deco building with the gold spire? That's the Union Carbide and Carbon Building, built in 1928. The architects of the Burnham Brothers, Daniel Burnham's sons. And it's said to be inspired by the New Year's Eve celebration when they opened a bottle of champagne and that it's their protest to prohibition. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is 24 karat gold plated on top. All right, so now we're going to go on to the left side of the boat. We've got the Ridley Building, which is where you got on the boat. Coming into view is a neo-Gothic tower called the Tribune Tower. It was the tallest building in the world. And it made the tallest building in the world for 24 years. It was built to be the world headquarters for Sears. They actually sold the building and moved to the suburbs in the 1990s. Not a lot of people realize they sold the building because the new owners let us just keep calling it the Sears Tower for over a decade. After 9-11, people didn't want to work in skyscrapers anymore, let alone one of the tallest in the world. So as their leases expired, the tenants moved out, and the building had very low occupancy. So along came the Willis Insurance Group. They're an insurance company out of London. They were the brokerage company for the Titanic. And they came along, and they offered a way for the building to stay afloat. It's just the tip of the iceberg. By renting three floors in exchange for the naming rights. So they rent three floors. They don't own the building, and they're not the principal tenant. The principal tenant is United Airlines, with about 25% of the building. Now I learned that United Airlines renegotiated their lease, and they now have the naming rights option. So when Willis's lease is up, it could become United Airlines Tower, which is better, because it is Chicago's hometown airline. I mean, either way, my heart will go on. Oh, yes. It's all coming back to me now. It is called the Willis Tower. That is the official name of the building. In Chicago, we spell that S-E-A-R-S. -S. On the 103rd floor is the observation deck. The latest addition is what's called the wedge, which are those retractable glass boxes that you can step out on and look down. Also designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. On the 103rd floor, oh no, the wedge has multiple layers of glass. The top layers are protective coating that keeps it from getting scratched. It needs to be replaced about every five years. The only way they know it's time to replace it is when someone steps out onto the ledge and that layer cracks beneath their feet. It happened most recently in June of 2019, so who would that information would be good. Now, Bruce Graham is the lead architect for the tower. Dr. Fazler Khan is a structural engineer, and he is considered to be the Albert Einstein of structural engineers. The building is made of what's called bundled tubular construction. So it's nine 75 foot boxes that are bundled together to allow for the height and protect from the room, making it a very, very strong building. That said, it does sway 18 inches in any direction you're going to get. What you wanted to do, and all skyscrapers do, to avoid structural damage like broken windows. But people who work there report going to the bathroom on a windy day and the toilet bowl water is just splish, splash, and wet. Which some people think is gross. I, for one, remember the great toilet paper shortage in 2020 and will appreciate a bidet any way I can get one. 
hashtag pandemic potty humor. All right, I'm gonna shift gears now and go back to the fire. So I talked about the aftermath of the fire, but I didn't talk about the cause of the fire. And you might be wondering, how'd the fire start? Well, we know the fire started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn. Legend has it, Mrs. O'Leary went out to milk her cow, got a little excited, kicked over a lantern, and ended up burning down the entire city of Chicago. This was widely believed, and Mrs. O'Leary was hated and ran out of town. We later found out it was a made-up story by an out-of-town journalist so they could sell more papers the next day. And in fact, in 1997, the City Council of Chicago voted to exonerate Mrs. O'Leary and the cow. Justice for the cow. So what it really was was a culmination of unfortunate circumstances. Chicago had been experiencing drought. We had about an inch and a half of rain in two months. And in fact, the entire Great Lakes region was experiencing drought. And there were fires throughout the fall in Chicago, including one the night before. So the firefighters were exhausted, and the equipment, well, let's just say it needed a heat. Also, probably didn't help that everything in Chicago was basically made out of wood. Buildings, bridges, streets, sidewalks, and pipes. Yeah. Also, the fire started in the industrial part of town, which means warehouses, and in the past, that's smart. It was a parking lot, but they didn't think it was ever going to be very valuable. So they were going to throw it in on the deal in 98. And their facilities made it to the Chippewa Hospital. And as you can see, they're developing it. It's a development called Wolf Point. Now, this is also an important area in Chicago's history. One of our first homesteads is there. Early 1866 people lived in Wolf Point. They had a general store, a church, a post office, and three taverns which is about on point for Chicago's tavern to population ratio. It was in one of those taverns where Chicago got out of its name. Trying to be out of the house area, and somebody called their version of what Native Americans call it. Native Americans call this area Chicago, which means stinky onion. Now we're headed down the south branch of the Chicago River. We've got this building with the arch, River Point, which is in 2017. The architects are Picard and Chilton. And as of 2020, it is LEED certified platinum. But the thing you need to know as we head down the South Branch is that all the buildings on the right side, they're built over active train tracks. And building over active train tracks, well, it introduces some interesting structure. Numbers. That's the most certified building on the North River side. Now, we're going to go down to 2017, the architects are Getcha Partners. On one side of the plot of land, you've got the river. On the other side of the plot of land, you've got train tracks. So the most the base of the building could ever be is 40 feet wide. You can't build a very tall building on a tiny little base. But they figured out a way to make it work. See these silver things? They're called I-beams. They're made with the steel from Luxembourg. And they're the strongest I-beams in the world. And they go deep, deep into bedrock. And on the top of the building is what's known as a mass damper system. It's 160,000 gallons of water and four containers on rollers. And if the computer indicates the wind is going too hard in one direction, it'll activate the damper system in the opposite direction to serve as a counterbalance, or ballast, if you will. And there's 100 on the river side. In 1990, Perkins and Will are the architects. And Boeing bought the building in 2001. They did not buy the land. They're on a land lease. What that means is that every year, they pay money to rent the land upon which the building may almost go. Which is ridiculous. It's just not the most ridiculous thing I'm hearing this tour today. That's gonna to come a few more buildings down. Now, some of you might have heard that Boeing was relocating their headquarters to Virginia. And that's true, they did. However, they still own the building and they kept the majority of people in Chicago. Then we have two North Riverside, completed in the 1920s. Halliburton and Root are the architects. It's Art Gecko. It was home to the very first public plaza in Chicago, as well as the Chicago Daily News, which is a newspaper that went out of business in the 1970s, but it's where syndicated columnist Mike Royko started his career. This whole neighborhood is called the West Loop. The West Loop is one of the hottest neighborhoods in Chicago. You will find some of the best restaurants in the world in the West Loop. 60, 70 years ago, it was skid row. All you want to find in the West Loop then is gym joints, flop houses, 
and the Broken Dreams. He got turned around when they built a series of four buildings called the Gateway Center. Gateway One is a 22-story international-style building, including 1965 Skidmore Owens and Merrill, the architects. Bruce Graham is the leader. Now, all of the gateways are built over the gates for our trains. And America, not even thing called air rights. That means you only get air above your home, above your property, so no one can ever build on top of it without your permission. Through the years, the owners of the Union Station have sold their air rights to six different entities, and they've turned around and resold them multiple times. It is to the point where the owners of the Union Station cannot figure out who owns what And it's a little confusing. It is, however, the most ridiculous thing Steward today. People are buying, selling, and renting air. Gateway 2 is an identical 22 story international style building as Gateway 1, completed in 1967, Skidmore Owens and Merrill are the architects. Bruce Graham is the lead architect. Now I've said Skidmore Owens and Merrill a number of times so far on this tour. They're an architecture firm that was established in Chicago in the 1930s, and they're prolific. And I'm going to give you a sense of how prolific they are. That black building is skip my own place on the right-hand side in the Dutch Kiss Ravel. I'll let you know when that's not the case. Now, Trump International Hotel and Tower is the second tallest building in the city of Chicago, the sixth tallest in the United States of America. It is 1,360 feet deep tall with the spire. The architects are Steve Morrowings and Merrill. The lead architect is Abrams. He is also the lead architect for the tallest building in the world. Does anybody know what that is? The Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And if you want a sense of how tall the tallest building in the world is, look up to the top of Trump and double that. Then we've got this black steel skyscraper, the American Medical Association building, completed in 1971. Its architect is really significant insofar as it's Zee Sander as final building. He died in 1969. As I mentioned, this was completed in 1971. He is an internationally acclaimed architect who moved here from Germany to teach architects at the Illinois Institute of Technology and brought with him what's known as the international style of architecture, which is defined by rejecting all non essential innovation. Mises' philosophy was less is more. Because he moved here to teach architecture, you're going to see a very strong museum influence throughout Chicago. A lot of international style buildings. Ironically, Bertrand Goldberg, architect of the Marina City Towers, we call them the Corn Top Buildings, Goldberg was a student of Van der Rose. He clearly rejected the international style. His philosophy was there are no right angles of nature, so there shouldn't be any writing as an architecture. A lot of people are very curious as to how these buildings are constructed. Think of a flower. The elevator is a stem, and each condo is a pie-shaped petal. And they really are pie-shaped. The narrowest part is where you enter the unit, the widest part is the balcony. One piece of pie is a studio, one and a half pieces of pie is a one-bedroom, two pieces of pie is a two-bedroom. Pie-shaped condos make for very interesting interior design choices. Now, it was completed in 1967, and in the 60s, people were moving from the city to the suburbs. They had an idea for a city within a city. When Marina City Towers first opened, it had a movie theater, a bowling alley, a grocery store, a dry cleaner, a marina, a couple of restaurants, and a skating rink. They unfortunately had to close the skating rink a few years ago, and someone accidentally skated over the edge. I'm kidding, that didn't really happen. There really was a skating rink, I just don't know why it closed. But now I have a sense of who's paying attention and how dark I can go with my humor. This blue-green glass building with the silver steel, the American Bar Association building, completed in 1986. The architects are Skid Morrowings and Merrill, the lead architect is Bruce Graham. Then we've got this red brick masonry construction building called the Lee Murdoch Center, completed in the early 1900s. The original architect is George Nimmons. Nimmons is known for his industrial work. So this is a converted warehouse. And if you were taking this tour in the early 1900s, you'd be bored. Because all you'd be looking at is industrial buildings. This is one of the few remaining left on the river. If you look up, there's a clock tower. Lots of clock towers in Chicago. 
Anybody want to know why? Why? Believe it or not, in the early 1900s, not everyone could have an iPhone. And how else are you going to know what time it is? I can't afford one now. They're like 1400 bucks. And we've got this blue green glass building with a silver steel. We went to North and South, including 2009. The architects of Ricard and with Chilton. And it is LEED certified platinum. So LEED stands for Leadership and Energy and Environmental Design. Platinum is the highest designation you can get. Lots of different features that make this building worthy of a platinum designation. It uses river water for its cooling system. So it takes the river water in, uses the cool down the air conditioner, and then spits it out in a degree or two warmer. It is one of about a dozen buildings on the river that use river water for its cooling system. And Chicago has the most LEED certified buildings of any city in the United States of America. Then we have the Merchandise Mart of Chicago, completed in 1931. The architects are Graham, Anderson, Crooks, and White. And it is Art Deco. Art Deco is defined by having a limestone facade, strong vertical lines that dry, dry out setbacks, and geometric ornamentation. It's also the second largest building in the United States of America, with number one being the Pentagon. It's got eight miles of hallway. It was originally built by Marshall Field to consolidate his warehouses. In 1945, they had to sell it due to backpacks 